In James chapter 3, it is talking mainly about the tongue. So we are going to look at the power of the tongue. It can be a deadly thing. There is a lot of good practical things in this chapter, but we are also going to look at it doctrinally. We are going to see how a tribulation saint would read this chapter. The Bible is an amazing book and that any person from any period of time could pick it up and get things out of it that are more relevant to him in his day than any newspaper, magazine, or news channel could ever be. First, we're going to see how the tongue is offensive. James chapter 3 and verse 1 says, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. The many masters in the verse is referring to being a master in many fields. Someone who becomes a master in so many different things has more room for error and will receive greater condemnation. Have you ever heard the saying, ignorance is bliss? Sometimes the less you know about things, the happier you will be. But the Bible says it is better to mourn than to laugh. The more you learn about hell, the more burdened you will be for the lost. The more you learn about the Bible, the more you will be held accountable. But the more you learn, the more you, be, you will be able to help others. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 18 says, For in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. The Bible is an offensive book, and the more you learn about the Bible, the more... Bible you will have hid in your heart, and the more you will speak God's words. The more you speak God's words, the more you will offend people. James 3 2 says, For in many things we offend all, and if any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. If you have been around people on the job, or have been in fellowship with other Christians, then you prob probably have figured out you are going to offend people. People disagree on many things and everyone is different. With there being so many religions and denominations, you are going to offend someone eventually. If we are proclaiming the word of God, then it is okay to offend people. But if you are just being a loud mouth and a smart aleck, then you should just keep your mouth shut. Proverbs 18 and verse 21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. And Ecclesiastes 5.3 says, For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by multitude of words. And Jesus offended people many times, especially the scribes and Pharisees. So it is okay to be offensive if what you are offending people with is the word of God. Jesus offended people, but yet he was still perfect. Hebrews 5.8-9 says, Though he were a son... Yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Jesus was perfect and sinless, but James 3 2 doesn't mean perfect in the sense of sinless. Job is said to be perfect, but yet he wasn't sinless. And here is the definition of perfect in 2 Timothy 3, 16-17. It says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. If you want to be silver-tongued, then the best way to do that is through speaking the words of God. Proverbs 10 and verse 20 says, The tongue of the just is as choice silver. The heart of the wicked is little worth. Psalms 12 and verse 6, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. 1 Peter 4 and verse 11, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. When we speak to people, we should speak the words of God. When we are asked a question about the Bible, we shouldn't give our opinion. We should give the words of God that we have hidden in our heart, even if they offend people. We shouldn't offend people with the tongue. 
in a smart aleck way, we shouldn't be self-righteous know-it-alls. And when someone acts like a self-righteous know-it-all to us, we should remember verses like Ecclesiastes 7, 21 and 22, which says, Also take no heed unto all the words that are spoken, lest thou hear thy servant curse thee, for oftentimes also thine own heart knowest that thou thyself likewise hast cursed others. We've all cursed other people and put down other people, so don't get all bent out of shape when someone says something bad about you. Next, we will look at how the tongue controls our actions. James 3.3 3 says, Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouth that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Just like something as small as a bit controls a horse, the tongue can control our body. When someone swears allegiance to the Antichrist with their tongue in the time of Jacob's trouble, they will end up getting the mark in their body. Revelation 13.16 says, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. So just as we put bits in the horse's mouth so that they may obey us, our body is controlled by a very small thing in our mouth, which is our tongue. And a quick commercial break here. Have you ever thought about how awesome it will be to come back on a white horse with Jesus Christ at the second coming? Joel 2 and verse 4 says, The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen so shall they run. Maybe we will control the horses with our tongue instead of with bits. We will speak it, and they will do it. They will obey us just like the ass feared the angel of the Lord in Numbers 22 and did what he said. And maybe the horses will even speak like Balaam's ass spoke. Where else would Satan have got the idea of talking reindeer? But back to James chapter 3, look at verse 4, it says, Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. The tongue here is likened to a helm, which is used for steering a ship. Just like the governor guides the ship with a very small helm, you guide your body with the tongue. For example, if you promise someone you will meet them somewhere with your tongue, you will move your body to meet them at that certain time. And in an argument, the more maneuverable person has to budge. Just like when two ships are coming at each other, the more maneuverable ship has to move or they will destroy each other. We should try to be the ones who control our tongue so well that we can stop talking and end the argument so that it doesn't escalate to violence. Next we will see how the tongue is deadly. James 3 5 says, Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. One of the seven things that the Lord hates in Proverbs 6 16 through 17 is a lying tongue. The great boaster in James 3, 5 will doctrinally be the Antichrist in the tribulation because he comes in peaceably and flatters, as it says in Daniel eleven twenty one, 21. And Proverbs 26, 28 says, A lying tongue hateth those that are afflicted by it, and a flattering mouth worketh ruin. And then Psalms chapter 12 and verse 3 says, The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips, and the tongue that speaketh proud things. A man like this causes havoc with his tongue. And Proverbs 26, 20 through 21 says, Where no wood is, there the fire goeth out. So where there is no tail bear, the strife ceaseth. As coals are to burning coals and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. Many people will die because of the Antichrist's tongue. And Psalms 141 1-3 says, Deliver me, O Lord, from the evil man. Preserve me from the violent man, which imagine mischiefs in their heart continually. Are they gathered together for war? They have, they have sharpened their tongues like a serpent. Adder's poison is under their lips. 
Romans 3, 13 says, Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. The Jews who get the sign gifts back in the tribulation, Moses and Elijah, for example, will be able to hear the Antichrist's deadly poison coming from his tongue and it won't hurt them. And they will not die until God is ready for them to die. They will have fire that comes out of their mouth that devours their enemies. And looking back at Mark 16, 18, it says they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. This was back when the apostles had the apostolic signs, and Moses and Elijah are going to get those same signs in the tribulation. Because those gifts don't cease until that which is perfect has come. And that which is perfect is the Lord Jesus Christ. And practically speaking for the Christian, the people who will hurt him the most is other Christians, and they will do it with their tongues. And in 2016, it will also be with their fingers. Christians are biting and devouring each other over Facebook, if you have a problem or concern with a brother or sister, then call them or text them. Don't go on social media and broadcast it to your entire friends list. If a brother or sister is overtaken in a fault, restore them in the spirit of meekness. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1 says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. If you think you're following this verse by writing about that person on a Facebook status, then you're wrong. I've heard of people going on social media and saying God might take away a person's child because they said that person was using the child as an excuse to miss a church service. They may not put the person's name, but it's detailed in a way that everyone knows who they are talking about. If you're worried about that person, call them or visit them. Don't air out their dirty laundry in front of 500 to 1,000 people on Facebook. Have you ever heard of ruining someone's testimony? But in the tribulation, people are going to have to watch what they say. What they say could get them in serious trouble. They're going to be in under constant persecution and running from the Antichrist. And their tongue was going to be a very serious thing, how they use it. And like I said, Moses and Elijah, they're going to be able to be susceptible to the Antichrist's deadly poison that comes from his tongue. And just like back when the apostles had the apostolic signs and they could drink any deadly thing and it wouldn't hurt them. So Moses and Elijah will be able to take in the Antichrist's deadly poison and it won't hurt them. But next we will see how the tongue is harder to stop than a fire. Your tongue is so hard to stop that it is just like a fire that can't be put out. God even goes as far to say that it is set on fire of hell. The fire in hell is never put out. James 3, 6 says, And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. It is very fitting that it says world of iniquity, because the Antichrist is referred to as the mystery of iniquity in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 7. And you remember how in Mark chapter 9, Jesus is talking about how their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And he said, if your eye offend you, you should pluck it out. And if your foot offend you, to cut it off. And your hand, if it offends you, cut it off. The same is true in the tribulation. And you know how I said the tongue moves the body? In the time of Jacob's trouble, a person would be better off to cut off their tongue than to swear allegiance to the Antichrist with their tongue and then take the mark. And then when they take the mark, they are damned and will be cast into hellfire. It would be better for them to just cut off their tongue than to swear allegiance to the Antichrist with their tongue 
and then they would take the mark of the beast with their body. The tongue is like a fire, and it is hard to put out. The Bible says sometimes we should just be quiet. It says in 1 Thessalonians 4.11, And that you study to be quiet, and to do your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. Proverbs 10.19 says, In the multitude of words there wanteth not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. 2 Thessalonians 3.12 says, Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. If you're not going to be quiet, how about building up your brother instead of putting him down and gossiping about him behind his back? It's really sickening to see a group of men who greet each other by putting them down. Men have a problem of insulting each other to one another's face, while women have the problem of insulting one another behind each other's back. Either way, you are biting and devouring one another. And so James 3, 6 says, And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So as the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. And this is where you get the saying, Let nature take its course. But next we will see how the tongue cannot be tamed. James 3, 7 says, For every kind of beasts, and of birds, and of serpents, and of things in the sea is tamed, and hath been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Since the curse in Genesis 3, animals are naturally afraid of man, and this is why they have to be tamed. But in the millennium there won't be any more curse, and man can interact with any animal. So animals can be tamed. People can tame lions, bears, and other dangerous animals, but the tongue cannot be tamed especially one that bites and devours others. Galatians 5 and verse 15 says, But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. But also people have hypocritical tongues. James 3 9 says, Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Look at the word similitude and how precise the King James Bible is with its words. Notice it didn't say image because man isn't back in God's image until he gets born again. After Adam sinned, he lost the image of God, and Seth is said to be born in Adam's image. Genesis three, or Genesis 5.3 says, And Adam lived in hundred and thirty years, and begat a son in his own likeness after his image, and called his name Seth. But before Adam sinned, he was in God's image. And since Adam sinned, he lost that image. Therefore, when we're born, we're not born in the image of God. Romans 5.12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. We get back into that image the moment we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what it's talking about in 1 Corinthians 11.7, where it says, For as much as he is the image and glory of God. But men have hypocritical tongues. They will cuss God one minute and bless Him the next. They will praise a man one minute and then cut him to pieces with their tongue the next minute. And James 3.10 says, Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessings, blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. And 1 Peter 1.15-16 through 16 says, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. You see this a lot today with so many blessing God one minute, saying they thank God for blessing them, and then the next minute they are adding the word damn to the end of his name. You see all these satanic TV shows and movies that blaspheme God, but yet when they get up to accept the awards, they say, I want to thank God for this. It kind of makes you think they are thanking the God of this world and not the God of the Bible. The true God of the Bible didn't help them make a movie or take part in the movie so it would be pointless to even thank him. LeBron James thanks the man upstairs for his championship ring, but then cusses like a devil later on in front of thousands of people. And James 3.11 says, Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? James asks a lot of questions. 
if I counted right, I counted 22 question marks in the book of James. And he asked, Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? A fountain doesn't send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter. A bitter person can have a nasty tongue, and a lot of times they can kill a person with their tongue. Their reputation, their marriage, their career, their ministry, all because they are bitter and angry and feel bad about past experiences, so they will use their tongue to wreak havoc on someone else's life. The word bitter is a horrible sounding word, and in the tribulation, the waters will be made bitter, and people die from drinking it. Revelation 8.11 says, And the name of the star is called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. Just like people are killed from drinking that water, you can be killed spiritually from taking in words from a bitter person. If you sit around and take in words from a bitter person, it will kill you on the inside and you will become bitter. But James 3.12 says, Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh? These three trees talked about in the Bible represent the three trees in the Garden of Eden. The olive tree would represent the tree of life in Genesis 2.9. In Genesis 8.11, Noah let out a dove and it came back with an olive branch in its mouth. A dove is a type of the Holy Spirit and olive oil is used for anointing in James 5.14. And when a man is saved, he is anointed by the Holy Spirit, as it says in 1 John 2 and verse 27. The olive tree would match the tree of life because the Holy Spirit seals people with eternal life. The thief who accepted Jesus Christ on the cross would represent the olive tree. Jesus told him he would be in paradise. And the fig tree represents self-righteousness. Adam and Eve sold fig leaves together after they sinned. This is a picture of a sinner in the church age trying to cover his sin with works. And Mark 11:21 says Jesus cursed the fig tree. But then in verse 22 he says, Have faith in God. As a picture of the sinner turning from his own self-righteousness to God. The thief who died on the cross rejecting Jesus would represent the fig tree. The vine tree represents the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Many believe Adam and Eve ate an apple off of a tree, but it was actually a grape. In number 6-4, it shows the grape is the only fruit God forbids someone to eat. The grape is also likened to blood in the Bible. In Deuteronomy 32 and verse 14, it says, And thou didst drink the pure blood of the grape. And blood is also forbidden to eat before the law in Genesis 9-4, during the law in Leviticus 3-17, and under grace in Acts 15 and verse 29. Moses' first public miracle was turning the water to blood, and Jesus turned the water to wine. So when Adam and Eve sinned and ate the fruit, their water circulatory system turned to blood. In John 19-34, when Jesus was pierced, blood and water came out as a type of this. Did you ever realize that Adam and Eve sinned with the mouth? They put something in it that wasn't supposed to be there. Sins of the mouth is one of the most mentioned sins in the Bible. Not only did Eve sin with the mouth by eating the fruit, but she also changed the words of God when she was talking to the devil, when she said, Lest ye die. Here is what Eve said that God said in Genesis 3.3. 3, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And then here is what God really said. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. He didn't say, Lest ye die. He said, Thou shalt surely die. She was the first Bible corrector, and Satan was also behind her correcting what God said. Just like Satan is behind all the Bible correctors today, Bible correctors are led by Satan, and the modern perversions of the Bible are out of the pits of hell. Men will use their wicked tongue to correct the book, and many have lost their voice after attempting to correct God's words. We don't correct God, we let God correct us. Next, we will look at how your works should match your tongue. Even though our tongue controls our actions most of the time, there are times when we make promises with our tongue and then break that promise. If we are going to profess to be Christians with our tongue, then we should show it in our works as well. James 3.13 says, 
who is a wise man and a dude with knowledge among you, let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. Conversation not only refers to our speech but also to our life. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 12 says, Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they spake, they speak against you as evildoers, they may be, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. A woman can lead her lost husband to the Lord by her conversation, not just her mouth saying godly things, but her being a godly example in front of him. In First Peter three, one through four, describes a woman who, through her chaste conversation, will can lead her husband to the Lord. And James 3.13 says, Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. And meekness is controlled strength, having strength and knowing when you should use the strength. 2 Timothy 2.24-26 says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, and meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taking, taken captive by him at his will. The vast majority of the time, we should approach people and be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. We are to be meek. It said, out of a good conversation, showing out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. And James reveals the difference between godly wisdom and worldly wisdom, because the workers of, the, of iniquity under the Antichrist will seem godly and wise, and because the devil is said to appear as an angel of light in Second Corinthians 11, as well as his ministers. Satan appeared as wise to Eve in Genesis 3.5, the Antichrist will have power, signs, and lying wonders, as it says in Second Thessalonians 2 7. And during the tribulation, there are going to be false Christs and false prophets, deceiving, as it says in Matthew 24 24. They are going to have wicked and worldly wisdom. And James 3 14 says, But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. And that stuff is what comes from false wisdom. Look at verse 15, it says, The wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. In Ezekiel 28, 3, Satan is said to be wiser than Daniel. When Satan is deceiving our country, he is using education. And the education now is a false wisdom. And education without salvation is damnation. The result of this wisdom is, is found in verse 16 of James chapter 3. It says, For where envy and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. But the right kind of wisdom is found in verse 17. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. True men of wisdom are ready to answer any question to any seeker of truth. He shouldn't get mad at the question, and he should be ready to answer on the spot. That is the wisdom that cometh from above. He should be ready to answer questions like, How were people saved in the Old Testament? And he shouldn't get angry. He should be ready to answer a Bible corrector who questions his faith in the King James Bible without getting upset. We should answer without partiality and without hypocrisy because we ought to have consistent answers. A man who has the right kind of wisdom will have a good conversation. His tongue will match his actions, and the outward fruit of this wisdom is righteousness. James 3.18 says, And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. He wouldn't be making peace because he isn't easy to be entreated and he gets angry. The wisdom from above is pure and peaceable. A wise man isn't always comparing others to himself and being a fruit inspector. A fruit inspector will say a man is lost just because that man is doing a certain sin that he himself isn't doing. The fruit inspectors don't make peace. They make strife and contention. A man's ministry 
shouldn't be based off of exposing the errors of others. That isn't pure, peaceable, and gentle. All a lot of these guys do is write books against other ministries and make videos against other ministries and just badmouth each other. And that isn't making peace. It's strife and contention. I do believe we are to expose error, but that is not what your whole ministry should be based on. Just bad-mouthing other Bible-believing Christians. A lot of these guys are so against every Bible teacher and preacher that it makes you wonder if they could get along with any Christian. We should get along with other Christians, and a wise man will get along with people because he is pure, peaceable, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. That doesn't mean we are to compromise. It just means if you've got the word of truth in your heart, then that truth bring con brings confidence and you're not going to get angry every time someone disagrees with you. But this has been James chapter 3 on the power of the tongue. We should use our tongue to build each other up. We should use our tongue to proclaim, proclaim the words of God. And we proclaim the words of God because we have the words of God hidden in our heart. And when you do that, you will show the right kind of wisdom. We will not be hypocritical with our tongue if we proclaim His words. Our tongue won't be full of gossip and set on the fire of hell if we stay silver-tongued. Silver-tongued because we are speaking the words of the Lord, which are pure words, as silver tried in the furnace of earth purified seven times. And I hope you have learned that there are times to be quiet and keep our smart aleck opinions and comments to ourselves. We shouldn't offend when it isn't necessary. And the times that it isn't necessary is when we are communicating to someone in a way that is contra contrary to what the Word of God says. Being a smart aleck know-it-all gossip, for example, is a time to, when you should keep your mouth shut. However, we can offend when speaking the words of God because the word of God will offend. But I hope this study has helped you and you will continue to study the chapter.